listening to the Daily Gold Podcast, covering precious metals, the junior mining sector, and global capital markets for intelligent investors. Now, here is your host, Jordan Roy Byrne. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Daily Gold Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. With me today is a brand new guest. Very excited to have him on. He is Axel Merck. He is the president and chief investment officer of Merck Investments. And they currently are managing $1.2 billion spread across several funds. I mean, Axel, we'll get into that later. But first things first, let's get right into it. I, I want the audience to be get familiar and me as well with your macro view. I mean, what what do you think is going on with the macro economy right now? And maybe where do you think that could lead us towards uh, by the end of the year? Sure. Well, first of all, great to be with you. Stunning that our paths haven't crossed. I think we've both been around the block a few times. <laughs> and um, the way I would describe myself is somebody who gets motivated by the stuff I see out there and don't like. And so it was in in 2005, we launched our first uh, currency fund to protect people from a falling dollar. Then there was a Eurozone debt crisis and uh, people couldn't stand currency things anymore. And we had started to invest in, in gold in the early part of the 2000s, launched the first the gold branded product or gold product in 2014. And, but if you ask me about my view, the reason for that is really, I, I, I don't pretend to have a crystal ball like anybody else. I am not a conspiracy theorist to put that up front. I actually think my view of the world is much darker than those of, of conspiracy theorists. And the reason is that if you believe in a conspiracy, you think there's a bad apple. If you only fix that one bad actor, everything would be fine. Whereas we have engaged policymakers, gotten to know several of them. We have as a senior economic advisor, Bill Poole, the former president of the St. Louis Fed. And uh, in having studied these policymakers, most of them act with the best of intentions. It's just that the road to hell may be paved with good intentions. And so it's just the dynamics of the deficit the dyna- in the fiscal side, on the monetary side, uh, the dynamics drive us towards a world where the purchasing power of the dollar is eroded and uh, where gold, in, in in our view, plays an important role as, as a diversifier. Okay, so zooming in to, I know that's kind of like a 50,000 foot view, and I love those views, but let's zoom in to where we are right now here with the economy and also the markets as well. I mean, you could touch on whichever side you want. Because I'm I'm seeing, well, not just I'm seeing, everyone is seeing all markets are essentially making new all-time highs. I mean, the stock market keeps chugging along. Gold, incredible breakout from a 13-year cup and handle pattern. So everything's moving. So in your sense, what do you think is going on in the markets? And how does that tie in with the economy today? Well, I mean, I don't want to tell people things that they already know. So let me try to to frame it in the way that I look at things. I always like to think about what could possibly go wrong. And of course, there's a bunch of stuff that could possibly go wrong. Um, the, ultimately, the, the reason why we and presumably you talk a lot about the Federal Reserve is because they own the bazooka. They control the reference point of what is considered the, the risk-free asset. You could argue how risk-free the dollar is, but... Everything is priced around that, right? Gold doesn't change. It hasn't changed in thousands of years, if ever. Um, it's, it's the perception that changes. And rather than having a, a central bank that acts based on where employment and inflation is, it acts on the whims of policymakers. So we are, we are bound to reading tea leaves. And the tea leaves, to make this little, going from 50,000 foot to 40,000 feet and lower, is that last October, Powell, Fetcher Powell shifted from his higher for longer mantra to announcing mission is accomplished. And basically, Powell was haunted by the stagflationary environment of the 1970s. And last October, for whatever reason, we can go into that, he felt that it is no longer important to pound the table that will be tough for whatever. Now, Suddenly, it became dependent on, okay, we'd love to cut rates, except, well, inflation hasn't really come down, and the economy is holding up better than expected. And 
the bias is now towards easing and uh, we and that's price of gold started taking note gold miners in particular the junior miners notably that were hostage of the tight credit conditions were suddenly freer to to act because the financial conditions are supposed to be a little bit looser and i argued at the time that when we have a rate cut federal reserve is not going to say hey we're cutting rates to the bottom no they're going to say we're not really cutting rates we're just lowering rates so that real interest rates don't continue to rise as inflation is coming down. And so we, we are in this environment where everybody is cooking with salt. The Federal Reserve doesn't know anything that we do not know either, but they have the bias. And so they would love to cut rates, but they are hostage of past data. And the reason I say they're hostage of it, it's a self-imposed prison, so to speak. Um, remember the days before 2008, where the Federal Reserve used to intervene in the treasury market to manage the federal funds rate. When the Federal Reserve, the New York Fed in particular, did that, there was an immediate feedback about the health of the financial system. You saw what worked, what didn't work, what institutions could participate. They got rid of all that by paying interest on reserves. And now they have these masses of regulations contradicting one another. They don't know what the liquidity problems are. And so they have to play firefighter when something happens. And now they're looking in the rearview mirror like everybody else, which hasn't stopped them from giving forward guidance, except that forward guidance is dead. And now suddenly these dot plots that were considered bad are now suddenly good. And so all of that creates volatility and uncertainty in the market. The, the gold investor likes that bias that we have towards the easing side. Uh, we can talk about that more. Um, notably, I happen to think that precious metals do better if we had a hard landing than, than a soft landing, because in a, in a soft landing, investors look through the downturn and risk assets such as the S&P will do just fine, whereas in a hard landing, investors look for more diversification and gold and gold miners will do much better. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you there. Um, so let's talk about gold against the stock market, because this is something I've been crowing about for the last couple of years. And even though, I mean, gold has had this great breakout, maybe it's starting to outperform the stock market a little bit. But I think if, you know, if you're a precious metals bear or detractor, that's the number one thing I would point to say the the stock market is still rising. We're not in recession yet. Yes, gold is broken out, but and gold's moving higher, but capital is still moving into the stock market. Uh, give me your view on that. And and I, I asked that question and, and and just want to want to say at the same time I do agree with you completely that a hard landing is best for precious metals not not well, a soft yeah. landing. Well, uh, I think the question people need to ask themselves: Why they invest in the first place, and why do they invest in the S and P? Why do they invest in in anything else, be that gold or something else? Is your goal in life to beat the S and P five hundred? Is your goal in life to have enough retirement savings, or is it something else? Um, I have seen plenty of studies. Yes, you want to be out of the S&P 500 in a, in a recession, but otherwise be in the S&P 500 and live happily ever after. Well, that may be all right. Um, but why do you have, for example, cash in your wallet um, and not everything in the S&P 500? There is a certain purpose that your dollar notes have in your pocket. There is a purpose that gold has in the portfolio. Now, gold is this odd thing that's just a brick. It uh, doesn't pay any dividend. With hindsight, through a most periods in history, it's been a valuable diversifier, but you never quite know why on earth should you hold it for tomorrow. Uh, and one of the beauties about gold is, of course, its lack of correlation, um, its sensitivity to monetary policy. I happen to think that the incentives of governments, notably the US government as well, are misaligned with those of investors. And so I think there's a purpose in gold. Now, is it supposed to be a sliver of your portfolio? Is it supposed to be an overwhelming part of the portfolio? I can't give specific investment advice. What I try to tell people is you should never have more of something than what you can sleep with at night. And I'm not talking about the physical bar and the, your pillow, but if you get nervous about what you're holding, then you're over-invested. Um, and gold, for that matter, is those who have been around for a long time know it can be very volatile. Uh, let me maybe tell you a story about diversification, if that's helpful. Sure. Um, where I very much disagree with um, the brokers out there. Most of you recall that in the spring of 2009, the S&P 500 reached, an all time, uh, reached a low before it really took off. And many brokers recommended 
recommend many, but some recommended that you double down on your investments and double down on the S&P 500. My reaction to that was that that's criminal. Um, even though it might have been a good investment decision. Of course, you didn't know that at the time. And the reason I say that is that most investors don't take chips off the table when the times are good. They should have taken chips off the table in the run-up to 2007 and maybe 2008. Um, but because they didn't, they had way more exposed to risk assets than their risk tolerance. And then they lost a substantial portion of that which means they lost more than they could afford to lose. In that context, in my view, it's completely irresponsible to double down on that. It's, it's just like going to the casino and always doubling down. In theory, you will win, but it's not good for your nerves. It's not good for your long-term financial planning. The, the math that you happen to invest at the long if you were to increase your risk assets are irrelevant in that. And so similarly, if you're comfortable with a certain gold allocation for whatever reason, right? You want to question whether the reasons are continue to be valid. But to me, the, my mission in life is not to beat the S&P 500. And so I'm perfectly okay not having everything that I own in the S&P 500, but being diversified. Okay. Let, let me zero in more on precious metals specifically. Um, are you seeing any generalist or retail money coming into your fund yet? Well, we, we have an open-end product and we have a closed-end product. So the closed-end one doesn't have, have flows per se. In the in our physical gold product, we have seen some inflows, more so than our competitors, maybe because we have some differentiating features. Overall, retail participation has been somewhat lukewarm. It's no secret that, that foreign central banks have been an active buyer in, in the precious metals. So on our end, and we tend to attract the more long-term investor, they have been net buyers, but not aggressively so. And uh, when I talk to local coin dealers, um, they've seen both. They've seen both buyers and sellers, right? And, and that's what high price can do. Uh, so it's been a, a healthy market, I suppose, because there are buyers and sellers around, but it is not. We have seen periods where there's been clearly a lot more demand as far as flows is con are concerned. So I, I know it's just your own story, but what does that tell you as far as where the precious metals might be with respect to you know gold's current breakout and the, the current move? Well, I'm considered a professional asset manager, but different from most of my peers, I actually give a lot of credence to, to the retail investor. I think they often have it somewhat right. And uh, when they, when I get somewhat mixed signals with a little bit of buying, um, that may well be where the temperature is. Now, that's probably not what you want to hear because you want to hear that buy, 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 or sell, sell, sell. But the the noteworthy thing here is that there is some prudent money tipping the toes and in, in adding more despite these record prices. And uh, and so we haven't seen those, uh, those big outflows. Now, the different from some of the, the bigger bigger peers that we have, they have much hotter money, faster money. And so one, I usually break down the precious metals investor into three groups. The, the investor concerned about purchasing power, the investor concerned about diversification and the speculator. And it's that third group that's been moving towards digital assets. And we, we don't, just because of who we are and what we do, we have never really attracted that hot money. And I think it's that hot money that's having fun with meme stocks, um, crypto stuff, and other things. I have no doubt that that hot money can come back if we have a strong move on the upside and they, these guys want to have a, a ride on the upside. But um, it, it's much better for the volatility, meaning a, a lower volatility that we don't have as many speculators in the space right now. Um, what do you think about GLD and the total lack of flows into it and gold rising? I mean, at, at the same time, I'm also wondering, do you have any sense of when investors might come back to GLD? Yeah, I don't want to comment too much on a competing product. Okay. That said, I mean, well, what let, I, what well, I let's like, just, let's just say gold, yeah. gold ETFs, which uh, yours is definitely included, included in that. Yes. So go, yes. I mean, go, well, gold ETFs. Yeah. No, I mean, we've seen, uh, We've seen a bit of flows back in, right? We haven't had any outflows. We've had some some inflows. 
And what that will trigger, I think, is the fear of a more severe recession. Um, people don't realize that just the attitude change by the Federal Reserve towards an easing stance can be very helpful. Um, and and as anybody, I think, who's been around a, a bit knows that timing these markets is very, very difficult. That's why I prefer to be a long-term investor. But if we had economic data that were substantially worse, I think the flows would be much better in these products. Um, I actually like it that that we have some time before the economy goes really down the drain, so to speak, right? I, I, I'm not complaining um, because I do think the, the relative stance of the Fed matters. Um, and uh, as long as we have this easing bias, that's a very favorable environment for the price of gold. And to just take a step back on that, right? Because many people, are, especially in our audience, are critical about in the what the central bank can do about inflation. Historically, and we saw that in this in this run of inflation here, but when an inflation print is higher than expected, the currency of a country tends to rise. And that might sound counterintuitive, but the reason why that tends to happen is because investors believe the central bank will do the right thing and get inflation back under control. It's then only in the subsequent weeks or months when reality kicks in that the currency weakens again. And so that's why these... Uh, bias is perception is reality, right? It's it's always what might happen in the future. And, and similarly, as an investor, what I look at is, well, what are the possible things that can go wrong? And am I taking those scenarios into account in my allocation? Okay, so then what are the things that can possibly go wrong? Are we looking at stagflation, a, a really hard disinflationary landing or something worse than those over the next couple of years? Well, I mean, I, let's just, without resorting to extremes, I bet on the consumer. And uh, the consumer has a high delinquency rate, um, is struggling to make ends meet, and the consumer is two-thirds of the economy. And so I happen to think that is a headwind that will materialize. I think that because the economy, based on the metrics that the Federal Reserve looks at, has been holding up all right, um, yes, they'll lower rates a little bit, but it's not going to be a dramatic change, which means these headwinds will persist. And keep in mind, um, one of the reasons why we're in this scenario is, of course, in this environment is on the fiscal side, we got this enormous stimulus. And then usually real estate would crumble when rates go higher, except we, of course, in a situation where consumers have locked in lower rates. And on the commercial real estate side, the Federal Reserve has converted an acute problem into a chronic problem by, by providing that lifeline to the smaller smaller banks. And you never quite know what's going to break the, the camel's back, so to speak, at some point in some of these institutions that might get the Federal Reserve to act more quickly. But they provide this, this backstop that usually if those market forces were allowed to play out, the economy would be doing far worse. And so we've come to a world where the central bankers of the world are increasingly trying to micromanage the economy. And if anybody tortured themselves and read Ben Bernanke's book um, that he, he published, I think it's two years ago by now, um, where he really foresees a world where Federal Reserve is so good at micromanaging every little problem, um, command economy comes to mind, um, that we're never ever going to have a recession again type of thing. Um, he wouldn't quite go that far, but it is really a, a really hands-on approach to the management of the economy with lots of downsides. And we have some of that. It's been added piece by piece that we don't even realize it. But in that sort of environment, one of the things you get is capital misallocations because you don't allow market forces to properly pay out. And in an environment of capital misallocations is one environment where, in my view, gold is doing reasonably well because you need to push more money into the system to, to achieve the same sort of gains. Okay, Axel, uh, just one last question before we wrap. Um, are there any things that you're thinking about that you want to share that we have not covered here today? Well, maybe one thing, um, quite often geopolitics is raised as an issue as to why the price of gold is moving higher. And historically, I used to say that I don't like the, that as an argument because when there's a crisis that flares out, 
the market gets used to it and it's only a short-term phenomenon. What has changed in the big picture, going back to the 50,000 foot view, I guess, is that I happen to think that the peaceful period we've had since World War II, a relative peaceful period, until a few years ago, is coming to an end. And what we see in Ukraine and, and Gaza are symptoms of a new era that we are in. And if one frames it, looks at it from, from that lens, then it is quite possible that gold will get a continuous bit from, from, from a less stable world environment. And of course, it, it doesn't help that on the fiscal side, um, it's becoming ever more apparent that both political parties are mostly interested in spending money to, to get us to be happy, right? Um, so, yeah, it's the geopolitics that I give a big, bigger emphasis than, than I used to. I guess that's that's one thing I would like to stress. Okay, and before uh, we sign off here, um, I know there's some there may be some marketing restrictions with products and and that type of thing. But could you tell our audience about the work you do uh, at Merck Investments and how that where they can go to find out more info? Yes, so I'll be very generic. Um, <laughs> please come to our website at MerckInvestments.com from where you can find information about our physical gold product, about our closing fund, and then I'm on Twitter at Axel Merck where I cannot comment on products, but I am chiming in on um, daily events that affect gold and 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 so, well, everything is, gold is so simple, but everything affects the price of gold. So I, I tend to be quite broad in, in the sort of things I talk about. But we have a newsletter at Merck Investments that, that's free, that uh, anybody is welcome to sign up on. And, and from there, you can look at the sort of products that we manage as well. Okay, that's MerckInvestments.com. Axel, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. And I uh, hope we can do this again uh, in the coming months. Sure. My pleasure. Thank you for tuning into the Daily Gold Podcast. For more interviews, editorials, and analysis, log on to thedailygold.com. And for premium coverage of precious metals and the best junior mining companies, visit thedailygold.com forward slash premium.